Thank you for making it possible for me to participate remotely. My wife is expecting our third child in a couple of weeks, and so I promised her I wouldn't travel until after the baby arrived. Some of the key trends in the mobile space will be um, there are so many things going on in this space. Um, to boil it down to just seven uh, was difficult. And I'm gratified to see that many of you are going to be going into depth on many of these things um, as you break into your group meetings. First trend, uh, saturation. We're all aware that mobile is massive across the world. What we're seeing now is that it is becoming pervasive almost everywhere. Uh, and soon it will be pervasive everywhere. In this map you can see only in the center of Africa and the Horn is there something like less than 25% saturation, 25% uptake. And across the globe it's becoming standard that not only does every family, but in some cases every person have at least one phone. Doesn't mean they're all web connected though. We do have um, 1 billion mobile broadband subscribers currently active in the world today. Uh, estimated that by 2015 we'll have 2 billion smartphones in activation. And it's projected that we will reach the official saturation point of 7 billion population, 7 billion plus population, and 7 billion active mobile subscriptions next year. Now, that does not mean that every single person will have a phone, but their access to a phone is almost um, guaranteed that either a friend or a family member will have a phone. However, this doesn't mean, again, that everybody will have access to mobile web. Um, one thing that's floating around out there is that there's more mobile phones in the world than there are toothbrushes. And there's also another one that says something about more mobile phones than toilets. Now, one trend that's very important for us as in the ministry realm is to look at the rise of many tablets and e-readers. Um, the mobile phone itself is a wonderful device. The reason I bring up the mini tablet is that it's a major trend for school children. In India, this Sky tablet, which uh, it can be manufactured and, and retailed at $60 US is planned to be distributed for $35 a piece with a government subsidy. Um, it has an SD card capability that goes up to 32 gig, has a 7 inch screen, 800 by 480 uh, resolution. It has a Wi-Fi capability, it has a cellular modem capability, it can run um, apps off GetJar and it's a version of Android. This is completely sourced inside India, and the first 200,000 units are being manufactured and distributed currently. Um, if that first run is successful, we can expect to see millions of units distributed to school children in India and possibly other parts of the world. This trend is a movement away from physical textbooks toward e-textbooks and e-learning experiences. Um, the scale of, um, well, e economies of scale are tremendous when you move to e-textbooks. It's much cheaper actually for, if they have a cheap enough device, for students to get their textbooks um, electronically than it is to keep up with paper texts. Also, they can be updated more readily. The, the opportunity it presents for ministry partners is that for the first time in history, you're about to see millions, tens of millions of children with access to a multimedia playback device that's supplied to them by their government or by some kind of agency, um, government, uh, charity, and they'll be looking for content. And we need to be prepared to supply that. Of course, you've all seen the uh, fire that came out of Kindle. Uh, they priced it at $200, so that gives you a sense of where things could go as far as capability within the near future. Another interesting one is out of Russia. This is a $50 manufacturing cost for a solar powered tablet. It's very, very rudimentary, but then it doesn't have to have um, any kind of extra work for recharging. 
there are about a dozen different countries in the world that are all working on different prototypes of e-books. And um, it's a very exciting area. And we should be prepared, not just for mobile, but also for the mini tablet. Operating systems have a, a um, major role to play in where we're going in the future. Um, right now, this is, and I appreciate Keith helping me um, to catch up with the fact that this is for smartphones. Global sales for the year uh, were broken out like this. Android made up 43% of the um, smartphone uh, mobile OS sales for the year. And everybody's talking about that. But if you look at the phones that are actually accessing the Internet, then the previously installed base of Symbian phones still outweighs it. Uh, mobile uh, iOS is using a lot more bandwidth, so they're the highest bandwidth users of all the OSs out there, but Symbian is still a major player, and that's even for smartphones. Now, by 2015, it's projected that Win 7 will become a major player as well. But it will take its positioning out of Symbian's space, but that's only for sales, not for installed base. So Symbian is still going to be a major portion of this installed base. Now, what gets very interesting about this is that as we move forward, we'll find that there are many players out there that are not happy with being excluded from having control over their space. We're seeing many carriers in Europe and some in the U.S. who talk about having their own type of walled garden for apps and web access. And we're hoping that that does not happen because that could further fragment the OS development environments which are already fragmented enough if you're familiar with developing for Android. Um, another important point to note for those who are developing apps is Microsoft has already said that for Win 7 that they will not allow any open source code to be submitted to their app store. And so if you're going to have to have um, proprietary code if you want to submit it through them, for iOS and Android both, we're seeing a tightening on the rules for their app stores. Um, many people are, been, many ministry partners have been slow to get into the iOS space. And what you're going to find is that many simple apps that you could iterate um, for different purposes are going to start to be blocked. They want to see individual development licenses for each app as, as another $100 to your development cost. Um, and sometimes they want to see additional features that make it look um, much more distinctive. And that's already presenting problems from uh, ministries that are looking to produce apps. Now, this next slide is just a, a quick estimate. I can, um, and I have to say that for the iOS and the BlackBerry numbers, uh, that's pretty accurate. Android is fairly accurate. And Symbian, I may be off by 5 to 8% on that. This is global installed base of all phones. Um, when you take up the 6.5 billion phones that are active today, that's a rough picture of the operating systems that are on those phones. Now, that other can be, is made up of all the remainders, um, a lot of the old WIN and um, about another dozen operating systems that we don't talk about very much anymore, but they're still out there. Content. Content is more important than ever. And some of the people in the room right now are working on trying to make content available uh, because of copyright issues. Um, some of the most powerful trends that I've seen uh, recently have been the rise of repositories. Um, SIL International has its own repository uh, for scripture and linguistics products, and they're looking to make that available to outside parties. Um, you already have people from Transworld Radio be telling you about their uh, LDMS and LinguaBlast, Lingua Host, um, sorry, LinguaBlast systems, um, a very powerful media database that I think they're selling as software as a service to a uh, number of partners. I've seen a demo of this, and it's um, outstanding software. And I, th and I think it will 
bring to the marketplace, if you want to call the ministry marketplace, uh, a whole new level of access to digital media that's sitting in, um, well, sitting in the back office of many ministries and making it usable in ways that have never been possible before. And then every tribe, every nation. Um, and this is a game changer for anybody who's dealing with scripture. And uh, that's one reason I want to put it here, and I'm sure we've got folks from Life Church who will talk in more detail. Every Tribe, Every Nation was basically designed around the idea of making as much scripture as, as possible accessible without the, the barriers of the copyright. It um, doesn't mean copyright disappears, but they're working in creative ways with those ministries that have the copyright to make it more readily accessible. They've built uh, partnerships with um, the copyright holders of about 90% of the scriptures globally. So the American Bible Society, Biblica, the United Bible Societies, and Wycliffe. That means if you're able to work with the ETEL Alliance, your access to those scriptures will be greatly accelerated. And if you're not able to, then your difficulty will remain as it is. Um, Right now, you have to go to each copyright holder, work out agreements. And our friends at Faith Comes by Hearing, they've been doing this for many years, and they can tell you how difficult that is. Um, this presents tremendous opportunity for us. Currently, the ETEL Alliance is working through um, this program. And it started in November of 2010 um, in the startup phase. They were moving to get 160 languages into their repository within 180 days. They were a bit behind schedule on that one. Uh, currently, they're in phase one, getting the next 60 languages up. And that's supposed to end uh, by schedule October 2012. And then they move on to phase three, where the next, next 780 languages, for a total of 1,000 languages, reaching 5 billion speakers. And again, I will defer to um, Life Church folks to give you more details on that. But that's the rough estimate of what you're looking at. Currently, the only people who have access to the repository are YouVersion. Um, there are plans for additional ministries to have access, but up to this point, nothing's been made public as to when that will happen or what the criteria will be for access. Over the long haul, then you'll move to phase um, three, which is designed to get the additional 5,000 plus languages out over the next 20 years. A lot of this will be things that are produced by Wycliffe in minority languages, some of which have not even started yet. And altogether, that will make the additional 3 billion speakers to cover the entire world. Things that are valued very highly by the ATM Alliance are print on demand, audio products, video products, minority languages, Mobile accessibility is extremely high value. Sharing in ministry, um, extremely high value that um, I will get to why that's so in the next slide. Engagement metrics. <clears throat> this, is, this has a whole section in uh, my presentation. This is changing the landscape of what's expected from those who are involved in electronic ministries. Uh, emerging technology is another high value of theirs and partnership. Now, Basically, if you're going to be working with the ETEL Alliance, anticipate to hit on all of these areas and what you plan to do in some way or another. Um, one thing you do want to avoid are the things that they hold in, in low regard, and that's duplication, competition, and conflict. Um, they really like to see alignment and cooperation between different partners. and um, really look to the idea of gaining efficiency and cooperation as you begin moving forward, especially with ETEN. Now, another key trend is Facebook. You have 800 million users currently. 400 million of those uh, are log on every day. 350 million of them are mobile users. And many of those are exclusive mobile users. So they don't actually access through a computer and more than 250 million photos a day are logged into Facebook. Very important, 75% of the users are outside the US of A. And that's 
critical for ministry purposes. Uh, the number two nation in the world is Indonesia as far as raw numbers of users on Facebook. In 2012, they will go um, IPO and they're expected to have a valuation of $100 billion. And they're also anticipated to, to breach 1 billion users at that time. One of the things that's projected about Facebook is that um, they could actually become the world's first identity server for the Internet. That they would be providing um, identity access and you would log in to everything on the web in the sense that needed an identity um, through your Facebook. They're adding uh, live music listening. You can share your friends, video sharing. Um, basically think of Facebook as a separate internet. All your browsing, shopping, video sharing, music listening uh, will all start to happen through that. And it really has Google running scared because uh, Facebook will be, in a sense, the owner of all the information about what you like, what you do, where you go, who your friends are, that is absolutely vital to marketers. And uh, Google is scared it'll be left out. If you've seen the development of Google+, Plus, um, realize that it is not really getting that much traction. Um, I, Facebook is not worried about getting too much competition from them. A very interesting study that was done uh, across 20 different nations and 20 different language groups about the reasons people use social media. And um, this study would be useful for almost any ministry that wants to take advantage of social media. So you can see why people are using it and see if you can connect with them based on the types of things they're using it for. For example, 32% uh, of all people say they used it for connecting with friends and family. Only 8% said they did it to make new friends. And something like 3% uh, said they were, sorry, uh, something like 4% said they were using it to create content. So if you're looking to engage with people to get them to create content, realize that there's only about 4% of the world who's using social media for that purpose. But if you're looking for them to share links to content with their friends, and if you want them to tell your, their friends about your content, then about 9% of them are prepared to do that. That's what they're there for. So this type of study can be very, very helpful. Engagement. I mentioned this one. It's a sort of a rule of thumb across the Internet that 90% of users read content. About 9% will interact with it in some way, make comment about it, and about 1% actually create content. And so if you have a user base who's using your app or who's using um, your website, if you exceed 1% of your users uh, actually creating content, then you are doing better than the average. Constant. As far as uh, commenting on it, you can get people to say they like it, share it with their friends. That's again, that's about 9% of those who are interacting on in general. But the silent majority is that 90%. Now, taking some data from Uversion, they gave um, some work for accessing the materials. I think this is in November of 2010. And they said that about 44% of the people who accessed did it more than twice in the same month. And you can see this drops down to about 7% of users access that content 20 times during the month. So that gives you a sense of how sticky the content was to that audience and what the level of engagement was. Um, when you look at their apps and their, their mobile access, um, Uversion has built in a tremendous amount of engagement measurement metrics. So much so that I believe that those of us who are in um, electronic ministry needs to take heed of this. Uh, I think donors and executives and people who evaluate will no longer accept the idea that you were able to produce something electronically and deliver it. What they're going to be looking for is can you prove and show the engagement level? How much is, did, how many people accessed it? What did they do with it? Um, did they indicate that they shared it with their friends? 
What parts of it were meaningful for them? And where do you go on from there? Are you creating new content for the things that people have already shown interest in? Again, this is a game changer. Uversion is um, Uversion and E10 together are going to be major drivers in the industry space as far as what's expected of those of us who are engaged with mobile and web and access to ministry products. And lastly is security. And this could be um, a whole weekend of talk, but what we've seen in the last few months has been false SSL certificates. I don't know if you've been following the Carrier IQ saga the last week or so, but it's known that the Carrier IQ software that's being used on many Android phones, more than 141 million phones with this software, it's basically an advanced key logger that sees everything that's going on in your phone, including everything that goes over SSL, your secure passwords, what, what you're doing with your media player, all the files that are listed on your phone, everything. Um, lawsuit between with Nokia Simmons and uh, over selling very sophisticated monitoring equipment to Iran, uh, Western companies that built a spy network um, for Libya to where they can monitor everything that was going across the cell nets. Um, Microsoft, Apple, and Google all doing constant geo-tracking of their users, even in violation of user privacy agreements that people clicked onto. Um, think cell tower technology, the uh, cell tower in a, in a suitcase that you can set up and any place that the phones think you're talking to a real cell tower and it gives um, the person who has access to that technology uh, access to your phone calls, to your text, to everything that your phone is interacting with on the web. Uh, we now have retail stores that are tracking their customers' cell phones, monitoring their behavior. And I think the most telling stat of all is the fact that there are now one million cell phone users in North Korea. If you went back just about three years, you would have found almost no cell phones in North Korea. They were, they were banned. And you have such an insular country. How was it that they got a million users in such a short period of time? Well, that's because North Korea knows that the cell phone is the most effective monitoring tool of their population. They can uh, monitor more closely and more intimately what their population is accessing, what they're doing, and this is the power brokers in their society than any other surveillance method possible. The implication of this for us in ministry is that if you're engaged in uh, using web and mobile for access to secure locations, you can expect that anonymity in most cases does not exist anymore. Um, the ability to monitor, to packet sniff, to um, break security is so pervasive that except on very highly engineered bases or very limited distribution modes um, over the web, will you be able to have anonymous users? This means that if you go into this transaction thinking that you're distributing anonymously, you're exposing your end users to serious risk. Now, it doesn't mean that they're not willing to face that risk. Some are. Um, and you see that in the use of Facebook and how it's been tracked so many times. Um, but if we should not fool ourselves about the level of security we think there are. It's, that's here. Um, one thing that I've been recommending um, over the past a year and a half is <clears throat> consider SD microchip transfer of content. I think that's still one of the most secure things you can do on a mobile. Uh, because it does not expose um, the content to these monitoring systems. Um, also, the ability to share from phone to phone. Once something's been transferred from SD, you can Bluetooth, IR, various other things. Uh, and that's still fairly secure, even with the carrier IQ sort of back door that's in so many phones. And I'm told I've got three minutes. And I'm actually done. The last slide I have here is to just remind us that it's not about technology. It's about Jesus and about helping people know him. We're privileged to live in an age where almost every person in the world 
has a digital media playback device and telecommunications device in their pocket. And we have the opportunity to share some very helpful and blessed information with them. But it's not about the technology. It's about him. And that's it. If there's any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer those. Well, yes, um, it could it could implode, um, but one of the things that they've done is um, Mark Zuckerberg is a master. Uh, one of his degrees is in psychiatry, in psychology, and much of what they do is they they make their product quite addictive. Um, it actually has one of the lowest user satisfaction rates of anything on the web, but people still use it massively because of the way it's structured. Um, it has an enormous amount of um, inertia, and one of the problems that's faced is that nobody, even Google, is finding it almost impossible to compete with it. Doesn't mean that they couldn't implode, uh, but right now I don't see anything on the horizon that's uh, a, a viable competitor. Well, how does this anonymous sims affect security? Well, actually, anonymous sims are going away in many countries. Um, if you, um, one of the things that's been a trend in, in so many countries is that they're requiring people to register for their SIMs. I know that people are using fake, fake IDs and things like this, but the ability to, uh, you've had a number of countries that have actually turned off SIMs that were not registered, and they did it to the scale of millions of users. And so the idea of the secure SIM, the anonymous SIM, is, is quickly disappearing. It still exists, but it won't be around that much longer.